This second video that we're about to jump into for chapter eight is definitely the most important of the four videos in terms of ideas that you'll continue to use for as many chemistry courses as you take, including the rest of Chem 1 and your future in chemistry, because this video, which covers chapter 8.2, is all about hybrid orbitals. Okay. And bonding in molecules that have three or more atoms is explained using hybrid orbitals. And it explains the bond angles that we observed and were introduced in chapter seven. Because if we didn't know anything better, we would look at water, H2O, and think about the hybrid orbitals that are present there. Or sorry, the unhybridized orbitals. There's a couple of p orbitals on the oxygen there that are 90 degrees to one another. So we would assume when they connect to hydrogens that those hydrogens would have a bond angle of 90 degrees, okay? Because p orbitals are perpendicular to one another. Yeah. But we also said when we learned bond angles, right? Tetrahedral is 109.5. And for water, it's about 105 degrees. And the reason we see that difference is because when atoms come together in a molecule, the wave functions that we introduced in chapter six that discuss regions of probability for electrons to reside right, are one thing in an atom, but they're another thing in a molecule. And so they get different shapes. And that process, Right, these new orbitals that we get is known as LCAO, Linear Combination of Atomic Orbitals, um, and we simply refer to that as hybridization. We have old orbitals that give us new hybrid orbitals. So what kind of rules do we see for these hybrid orbitals? Okay. Well, first thing, we're always thinking about a center atom when we're discussing hybrid orbitals. Uh, just like when we were discussing molecular geometry. So we're looking at one center atom. Okay? And they don't exist on the atom by itself. Okay? It has to be participating in a molecule, so have covalent bonds. It has shapes and orientations that are different from the atomic orbitals previously. That's kind of what we were alluding to before. Rule three tells us the number of hybrid orbitals in a set is equal to the number of atomic orbitals combined to produce the set, which is a lengthy way to say that however many orbitals go in to the linear combination process is equal to the number of orbitals that come out. So however many atomic orbitals we put in, that's how many hybrid orbitals come out from the hybridization process. Yeah. Rule four says all orbitals in a set of hybrid orbitals are equivalent in shape in energy, okay. just like um, unhybridized p orbitals. We considered those in chapter six to be degenerate. They're all of the same energy, okay? Hybrid orbitals that'll be coming out here, same shape, same energy. Those new hybrid orbitals okay, are, right, the type that are formed depend on valence shell electron pair repulsion. Okay? So truly, it's hybridization that controls the shape. We introduced VSEPR in chapter seven to discuss electron pair geometries and molecular geometries, but really it's the hybridization here in chapter eight that controls the shape of these things. And lastly, this is something I alluded to in the first video, hybrid orbitals can overlap to form sigma bonds. It's only unhybridized p orbitals that can overlap to form pi bonds. So the golden rule to determining hybridization, all right? the number of hybrid orbitals formed is equal to the number of atomic orbitals that went in and were combined. Fine, okay? And to determine the hybridization, we just need to think about superscripts. So that's a golden rule to get our hybridization state. You'll see by the end of the video how we use that. Okay, but before we can get to that, we need to remember our orbital diagrams from chapter six. So this will be, next slides will be a little bit of review. I'm gonna go through this quickly because the nice thing with the online format is you have the chapter six videos to go back and review. Okay. In chapter six, we learned about orbital diagrams, which with these boxes or energy levels, 
right, we showed different electron configurations and how the electrons are paired. Yep. We started with hydrogen. We always show an arrow going up first. Then that electron became paired with helium, right? Has an m sub s of minus one half. But that filled our 1s orbital. Then we went to lithium, yep, where we opened up the 2s. Beryllium closed the 2s. Okay? Keeping in mind, we can never have the same set of four quantum numbers. And then when we got to boron, we went into the 2p orbital. Okay? But Hun's rule told us that we fill each one of the boxes as we go to carbon before we start to pair them up. Okay, so we go from boron to carbon to nitrogen, and then when we get to oxygen, they start to pair up with oxygen, fluorine, and neon yet again. So we could represent those orbital diagrams with boxes. We saw orbital energy diagrams as well, right? Notice energy there on the y-axis. Further out they get from the nucleus, higher energy they become. Okay. Here I see an example of a filled energy electron diagram, right? Filling the Aufbau principle from the bottom up to the highest energy. And if you want a quick practice, pause the video and figure out what this energy diagram is for. And when you do that, you'd see that it's filled all the way in here. We just have one valence electron, the 4s1. So this would correspond to potassium. So that brings us back to chapter eight. Okay. Figuring out our hybridization. Okay. In order to do that, what we need to be familiar with is figuring out regions of electron density. Okay. And there are two possibilities to have a region of electron density. You can have a bond or you can have a lone pair. Okay. So a hybridization that has, there's five types that we'll see in this chapter. This is the first one. Something that's sp hybridized occurs when we have our center atom surrounded by two regions of electron density. And remember, this thing has to be participating in some form of bonding in order to have hybrid orbitals. Okay? If it was just a lone atom, it wouldn't do it. But here, beryllium okay, in BeCl2 is surrounded by two chlorines, no lone pairs. So it has two regions of electron density. Okay? And that means it has two sp hybrid orbitals. Where do those sp hybrid orbitals come from? Well, it comes from an s orbital and a p orbital. We put those two in the hybridization blender together, one s orbital and one p orbital, and we get two new hybrid orbitals out. Two went in, two come out. And that's why they're called sp hybrid orbitals, because they came from one s and one p. So those are our two new orbitals, and they want to be as far apart as possible, okay? So they end up being linear, 180 degrees apart, which is the geometry that we would have predicted for BeCl2 in Chapter 7. But you do have to know the Lewis structure, be able to draw the Lewis structure from Chapter 7 before you can determine the hybridization. And this is what the energy diagram looks like for that. I went from beryllium before with the 2s and the 2p, right? There's one 2s orbital and three 2p orbitals that are degenerate, same energy. Yeah. Two electrons in beryllium. I bump one up to the excited state. Okay. And then when I undergo the hybridization process, these two orbitals get hybridized. And remember, hybridized orbitals are the same energy. So I get two new sp hybrid orbitals. And then I've got two 2p orbitals that are left over. And then I fill these corresponding to the Aufbau principle and Hund's rule. Okay. I put one electron in each box. Those two that are left in beryllium forms two bonds in BeCl2. So that's our first hybridization. If we have two regions of density, we are sp hybridized. Three regions of density, now we're sp2. And there's only ever one s orbital, so these things always start with s. So if I need a total of three, now I'm taking in two p orbitals. So one s and two p come together to make a total of three orbitals, and those new hybrid orbitals are called sp2.
So 1s and 2p come together to form three sp2 hybrid orbitals. We see that with BH3, okay? Draw the Lewis structure for BH3. Boron is surrounded by three bonds. So it is sp2 hybridized. 1s, 2p's come together, new orbitals to, you know, to follow valence shell electron pair repulsion and be as far apart as possible. They're 120 degrees apart. What about four regions of electron density? Okay. Now it's 1s and 3p's coming together. So 1 plus 3 equals four new hybrid orbitals, and those new orbitals are called sp3 because it was 1s and 3p's that came together. Okay, so that's when we're surrounded by four regions of electron density. We see that here with CH4, methane. 1s, 3p's come together, form four new orbitals, and to fo follow VSEPR and be as far apart as possible, those adopt a tetrahedral arrangement. Now, what about when something's surrounded by five regions of electron density? I used my s orbital, and now I've used all three of my p orbitals here, right? There's never a fourth p orbital because that would mean the p subshell could hold up to eight electrons. There's only three p orbitals, px, py, and pz, so now we've used them up. So if I wanna surround something by five regions of electron density, I have to pull in a d orbital. Okay? And this only happens with things that are hypervalent. Because when I'm surrounded by five regions of electron density, I've exceeded the octet rule that we introduced in chapter seven. But it is possible, okay, anything that's phosphorus or above in terms of atomic number, if I'm surrounded by five regions of electron density, I made I make five new hybrid orbitals, and that works by taking one s, three p's, and a d. So those five new electrons are called sp3d and that looks like this take an s take the three p's take a d and i get my new orbitals sp3d if i'm surrounded by six regions of electron density i just need a, one more d orbital so that's called sp3d2 so if i'm surrounded by six regions of electron density i get six new hybrid orbitals it came from an s three p's and two Ds, total of six sp3d2 orbitals. And that's what these guys end up looking like, okay? sp3d, sp3d2. All that information is summarized nicely on this table, right? And we see now that the hybridizations control our shapes, linear, trigonal planar, tetrahedral, trigonal bipyramidal, and octahedral. So let's take that information and see how we determine the hybridization of a center atom. Now, the first thing is always to draw the Lewis structure. Okay, draw the Lewis structure, use the octet rule, calculate formal charges, make sure you have the best possible Lewis structure. Okay. Then, after you do that, determine how many regions of electron density you have surrounding that center atom. Okay. So keep in mind, it's just a region of electron density. A different way to think about that is a place where electrons are. So a single bond, a double bond, a triple bond, a lone pair. Any of those just count as one region of electron density. Okay. Then however many regions of electron density we have corresponds to the number of hybrid orbitals we have. So then we assign the set of hybridized orbitals that corresponds to that geometry. And this is where the superscript trick comes in that I talked about. Yep. Looking at this structure, what's the hybridization of selenium? Yep. Well, we're given the Lewis structure, so this is a nice, easy problem. I just have to count the regions of electron density. Yep. There's one, two, three, four bonds, plus one lone pair, means I have five regions of electron density. So I've got five regions of electron density. And there's only five possible answers for hybridization. They're sp, sp2, sp3, sp3d, and sp3d2. 
Okay. Now keep in mind all of these numbers should actually be superscripts. I, I'm just doing this quickly. So those are your only possible answers for hybridization. In which one do the numbers add up to five regions of electron density? Okay. Keep in mind, there's a superscript one on S that's implied but not shown. And there's also a superscript one on the P here that's implied but not shown and on the D right here. So the only one that has those numbers adding to five regions of electron density is S1, P3, D1. So that's the correct answer. SP3, D is the hybridization of selenium. As long as you can count the regions of electron density and add on your fingers those superscripts, you can always quickly and easily determine the hybridization. So let's think about another one here to finish this video. This is something you could expect on a quiz or a test. What's the hybridization of phosphorus in PF5? Now we have to draw the Lewis structure first. So for good practice, right, pause the video, draw the Lewis structure, and figure out the answer to this problem. The first thing you're going to cross off if you're tackling this problem is answer A. That's not a hybridization. Okay. These are the only possible answers for hybridization. So draw the Lewis structure, count the regions of electron density. For PF5, phosphorus doesn't have any lone pairs, but it's surrounded by five single bonds, all going to a fluorine. So in this situation, the answer is again sp3d. But that kind of shows us two different molecules. There's multiple ways we could get the same hybridization. This one had lone pairs, PF5 didn't. Treat all your regions of electron density the same and you'll be golden to determine hybridization, which is a key idea from chapter eight.